I have the pleasure of having here Jerome Glenn, Executive Director of the Millennium Project. Welcome to this interview. Thank you. Uh, Millennium Project uh, is a global think tank with some 40 nodes as networking around the world, and you are its primus motor and uh, director. And the annual report, State of the Future, is one of the most respected ones in future studies. And uh, I would now like to ask you, how would you define, characterize Millennium Project at its present form? Ah, the, well, the Millennium Project in the present form is in a process of transition. Uh, it has been, and still will continue to be, a global participatory think tank of nodes around the world that identify leading thinkers, uh, involve them into research, bring that all together, uh, and feedback through different languages and back and forth and back and forth and then out comes a state of the future report, a physical report like this one, if I can pull it right, yes. right here, it's a physical report and then we give in the back a CD-ROM that has the 8,500 pages of our previous research there. So transition is we would like to go from the idea of doing an annual state of the future report and an occasional futures research methodology. There's version 1, version 2.0, 3.0. But it's by four, five, six years in between these versions. So what we'd like to do is create a collective intelligence that integrates all the people, uh, as well as external viewers, uh, all of the research, all of the methodology, into an ongoing interaction of people, software, and information so that the state of the future report would be an ongoing state of the future report. So you wouldn't need to wait until next year if something important has happened with future implications. As those future implications are understood, they can be discussed, they can be vetted with peer review, and it can be right on, on the online system. So that you would, let's say, look at challenge number five on decision making or something, as new software for decision making came online as available, it can be linked to it and discussed in it, and so the state of the future would be an ongoing state of the future, continually uh, evolving rather than an annual. And the same with the, um, uh, with the futures methodology. So if new applications of certain methods or better applications are there, then we can put those in as they occur. So we'll see how this transition occurs, because people are used to saying, I want to have the thought report in my hand. That's right. Well, can we do this transition? We'll see. Yes. We'll see. So the project has been expanding and growing mm -hmm. a lot during these years. Yes. And so this is exactly this idea of a global futures collective intelligence mm -hmm. system that you described mm -hmm. yeah. here. And when did you actually uh, realize that it is needed or uh, or when this idea well, arose? Yeah, I would say, believe it or not, around 1970, late 70s, I was an experimenter in the United States uh, with the National Science Foundation, uh, along with, uh, later came in uh, Frank Catanzaro. We were both in the early experiments on computer communications. And, and it, was, it was done uh, through the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and the system was called EYES, Electronic Information Exchange System. And we referred to the idea of building collective intelligence, so that you should have different people in different locations going through things. So it wasn't a decision of one group or another group, but an interaction. And you continually, uh, the collective intelligence emerges on an ongoing basis. So it's not an answer at a given time. It's a system that creates this improved intelligence uh, of the group. Um, now, that was primitive early stuff in those days. There's only a handful of people. Uh, so uh, that's what got me going on it um, to begin with. But as years went by, I got distracted into other things. And now we're getting to the point that it, it, it really does make sense uh, to do this. Because it, is if futures were saying that the rate of change is going fast, okay, well, if it's going faster and faster, then does that mean we have to do a quarterly report? A monthly report, well, let's do an ongoing one, like your brains, yes. ongoing systems. Yeah. So that's the idea. Link them. Yeah. Have a look at it all the time and real time. Uh, then, uh, what do you personally uh, consider to be the greatest achievement within Millennium Project so far? There's, of course, a right. lot of <laughs> great things. I'm hoping, I'm hoping somebody will come up with a better answer. But I'll, here's some, some answers. 
One, when we began uh, officially in 1996, one of the first things we did uh, was to look at environmental security. There were no real good definitions and no real good coherent programs. There was a little bit uh, in the former Soviet Union in Russia, a little bit in CIS, there was a little bit in NATO and a little bit in the US, but it really wasn't great. And we brought together military attaches around the world um, in Washington at the World Bank and started this conversation. What is it? What it should be? How would we do it? And we've been doing reports on this for about 10 years every month. Uh, people can still see them on our website, even our old website, hopefully the new one too. Um, and I would say that those reports have changed the climate of opinion around the militaries of the world. There's no serious major military in the world doesn't have some environmental security uh, approach. Uh, that they understand that when they do training, they can't wreck the environment. Uh, if they do wreck the environment, they got a responsibility to clean it up. We understand that environmental factors are causing wars. Well, we got to affect those factors so we don't cause wars. And when we do have wars, there's things to clean up after those wars. So the whole relationship of the environment uh, is, is di different, uh, I think. The uh, Land Project has contributed to that. We did a special study on the International Criminal Court and environmental security. Um, and in that report, we had the spokesman for the Secretary General, who just retired, uh, do a lot of interviews for us. And we determined that there was, the environment wasn't in the status of, a form, status of forces agreements in the UN around the world. During our study, the Secretary General came out saying, OK, here now we've got to do this. So I would say the relationship between environment and security would be one major impact. Another one I would say, as you may remember, uh, during we did a three-year feasibility study between 1992 and 1995 or so. And during that time, many futurists said, global futures research is impossible. It's too much, too complex. And if you do, then you end up with you know, nonsense generalizations that won't matter. Well, a lot of our stuff gets very detailed and very precise. But we do cover across broad things. So some people might, and they should, say, well, you know, you can do a better job. You know, there are better ways to do this. But now no one questions that global futures research shouldn't be done. It should be done. And the third one is the idea it should be participatory. Yes. Think tanks in the past where it's like, you know, you have a bunch of old guys up on a hill. They did the study. They did the report. And you didn't know how it got there. <laughs> you know? Now it's like we're opening up the whole system. So the Millennium Project has helped open it up participatory systems around the world that wouldn't normally be that way. Yes. Or they would eventually be that way, but we speeded it up. Yes, it definitely has had an impact. And the final question, uh, what do you see as the most critical element from Millennium Project from today, let's say the next 10 years to develop? One challenge is, of course, it's growing and a lot of challenges, interesting things, but um, how would you describe as critical element, or are there any tipping points that... Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll think of that word, or that phrase, critical elements, in several ways. Yes. One is, will we be able to keep coherence? Now, we have a node in Tehran, and we have a node in Tel Aviv. We don't expect them to agree with each other. But we expect them to equally participate in studies, like we did the Middle East peace scenario. Yes. Participate yes in those. And so they didn't, and we didn't think they have everybody in the same room, but we had everybody in the same cyber room. And we, we and, and I was worried that when we did this, that that, that study might tear us apart. Because these are very strongly held views by people. Uh, it's not an academic <laughs> exercise, it's real people with real bodies and so forth. Um, and it held together, and it had an influence uh, on the Muslim Brotherhood, as a matter of fact. Uh, um, a lot of people said they acted differently than people expected. Well, because it challenged some of the basic assumptions, and they, and they did some new thinking. Now, that having said, has been done, but can, will we be able to, as we continue to grow and get more detailed and more complex, will we be able to have that sense of coherence? Even though Tel Aviv and Tehran uh, see themselves quite differently. They do see themselves as part of a money project, as do you. Mm. So there is a camaraderie. Can that camaraderie or that good feeling be maintained while dealing with very sensitive, touchy yes. issues? Yes. 
that's a big challenge. That's, right. so that's one of the main challenges. Yes. Uh, is the old tragedy of commons. Remember the tragedy of commons? Yes. Everybody wants to take from the commons, yes. but they don't necessarily give back. So it's hard to raise money because you say, well, what do you do? Well, we do all this stuff. They say, yeah, yeah, well, is that environment or is it technology? You know, because people want to have something focused. Mm -hmm. So we'll contribute to your work on this. But you say, well, yeah, but we need you know, income for the general thing to take care of the nodes and the travel and all that sort of stuff. It's an expensive operation. That's also a challenge because as it gets bigger, it gets more costly. That's right. But it is exactly this systemic approach which is important inside Millennium Project. So, so thank you very much, Jerome Glenn, for this interview. Thank, thank you. you.